Hey friend, in this video we're going to be talking about color theory and how colors work when using watercolor. So when I first started researching and digging more in depth into color theory, that's when everything about my painting experience changed and transformed. I enjoyed the process more because I understood how colors combined together created harmony or disharmony. I understood what color to mix up next to put it on, on a page next to a yellow green or a blue green how to add contrast and avoid strain and balance. All of those things are gonna be covered in this video. So if you have been scratching your head when it comes to color relationships, color harmony, and color theory, then this video is for you. Okay, so color theory. I used to teach these in-person watercolor classes ever since, what year do you think I started, 2014? Yeah, probably 2014. So in 2014, I started teaching in-person watercolor workshops and calligraphy workshops, but we're talking about watercolor today. And I would bring along, as a part of the watercolor kits for each student, I would bring along these booklets. I had them printed um, and they were basically, you know, they covered supplies, they covered color theory and all of the things that you need to know to get started with watercolor. And um, it, we are gonna link to this ebook, so you can print it out at home if you want to, but there's gonna be a good section in here. If you don't have my book, Everyday Watercolor, which goes way more in depth on color theory than this booklet does, but if you don't have it and you want some you know, reference, you want some guide to help you along through this video, then I definitely recommend downloading that freebie that we have. It's free. All you have to do is enter your name and email and it will be sent to you so you can download it and print it at home if you want to. Um, but let's talk about color theory because that is something that most beginners, and even if you've been painting for a while, most people kind of don't explore enough. Um, obviously we know basics of color theory for the most part, or most people do, I think, because it's just kind of taught in elementary or high school art class. Um, but it's always a reference point. It's something that I am very grateful that I've taken the time to study more. Um, and just as from my experience in learning piano over the years, when I, I started learning piano when I was 12 and I started with a teacher that taught me how to sight read. And that's very valuable, obviously being able to sight read. But then I switched piano teachers and he taught me music theory. So he taught me the foundations of why certain chords work together and how they harmonize and thirds and fifths and tonics and subdominant and all these different things about music theory so that I could just sit at a piano and play because I understood relationships between chords within a single key. And this is the same thing. So color theory is gonna teach you color relationships, how they correspond with each other so that when you are looking at a blank sheet of paper, you can pick up your brush and you can have more confidence of where to put certain colors. You know how to blend, how to mix colors a little bit more confidently and easily because you understand color theory. So exploring color theory, this is like, I mean, I, you could teach a thousand hours on color, color theory and the color wheel and color relationships. And we're not gonna do that obviously, because that would be very boring eventually. Um, but I'm gonna briefly talk about it in this video so that you, you can actually I think it's just so eye-opening and I think it's very um, fun to talk about. So obviously a color wheel consists of uh, at least three colors. Those three colors being that always are on this color on a color wheel are red, blue, and yellow, your primary colors. So this is traditional color theory. I'm not gonna get in the more, you know, the battles between the different types of color theory. I'm going with traditional color theory because that's how I was taught. But red, blue, and yellow sit as a triad or triangle away from each other on the color wheel at all times. Different color wheels will have, you know, red, blue, or yellow at the top. This one has red at the top, then we've got blue over here and yellow is sitting over here. So they always make a triangle depending on, you know, what type of color wheel you have. This is a tertiary color wheel, so we have 12 colors. Um, I mixed up more than 12, but this is a tertiary color wheel will have 12 colors or 12 little pie slices. And so we've got red, blue, and yellow, your three primary colors. These are the colors that you can't mix up, um, you know, just out of the blue without any other colors. These colors mixed together will make brown or black sometimes, depending on what type of red, what type of blue, what type of yellow you use, um, but usually we'll make black. Um, so if you don't have black in your palette or you ran out or something, just try mixing up your three primary colors. Um, but combined together in equal parts, uh, two primary colors combined together in equal parts will make what's called a secondary color. So secondary colors are equal parts to primary colors. So red and blue in equal parts, parts makes violet or purple. 
Blue and yellow in equal parts makes green, yellow and red in equal parts makes orange. And then we're getting more and more into the family unit of this color wheel with tertiary colors. Tertiary colors are the ones with the hyphen in the name. So red, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, green, blue, green, blue, violet, red, violet. And by the name, the secondary name in the title of the, of the color is going to be what it's leaning more towards, or sometimes it's the first name. So yellow, orange, obviously there's more yellow in the mixture than there is red. Um, yellow, green, there's more yellow in the mixture than there is blue, etc. All right, very basic, but let's actually get into the relationships and why this matters. So um, there's a bunch of different types of co color combinations when you're just looking at a color wheel. You can combine, obviously we can talk about contrasting colors. Those colors always sit directly opposite of each other on the color wheel. Um, and I want to talk about it in terms of because I'm such a visual person and this is just how my piano teacher taught me when he was teaching me chords and shapes of chords and how they relate to each other. I'm just a visual person. So if you think about opposites, let's talk about it in our actual human interactions and relationships. You hear that all the time, opposites attract. So contrasting colors can also be complementary colors, but it's when they're used properly or when they um, one is maybe a lighter hue than the other. So one can shine and that other contrast or element of the contrast is a little bit more of a supportive role. Um, or maybe this isn't a direct contrast, obviously, but maybe instead of having red and green, you know, traditional, totally. So instead of having just red, pure red and pure green, maybe you shift the green a little bit to the left or to the right and you add a little blue to it or you add a little bit of yellow to it to offset that direct contrast. So when this comes to using contrasting colors or complementary colors in your paintings, you wanna keep an eye on areas where you can add contrast because contrast brightens the colors on your paper. Contrast adds a bit of, whoa, what's that? It makes people wanna look at it and maybe stay there for a little bit longer. But if it's used improperly, if it's creating a lot of disharmony, then people are gonna to wanna to look away. They don't really know why it's a subconscious decision. And it's usually because you're using something that just causes more strain than people wanna look at. So that will typically happen if, for example, you're using equal dominance of value. So a really deep, rich, powerful red and a really deep, rich, powerful green. If that's used a lot or if it's used too improperly, like if you're painting with a really light floral piece, let's say, and then you have a really bright or bold red next to a really bold green, then people are gonna just land right there and stay right there and they're not gonna move across your paper. So you wanna make sure that you're using contrasting slash complementary colors uh, properly so that they create harmony. However, there are really interesting ways that you can use bold contrasting, like what you would think would be, you know, grinding on each other colors, red and green or blue and orange, purple and yellow, etc., cetera, um, on purpose. And it makes the piece really interesting. So if I'm using that bold blue or bold red and green, I'm just making sure to create balance on my paper in terms of um, how the actual paper feels weighted. So if I just have the bold red and green up in this corner, that balance, it's gonna be tipping to the left corner and it's gonna feel like the paper is falling off and people are just gonna land and stay right there. And that's, we don't want that. But if we're creating purpose with our balance and we're creating even weighted zigzag across our paper like this or an S curve across our paper, our paper is going to feel like it's, it's balanced, it's even, it's not tipping on one side or the other, literally, feels that way or looks that way with your eyes. I know this may sound weird, but I'm just a very visual person and it's the same thing with photography. It's the same thing uh, with creating balance in composition when you're painting. You want to make sure your painting isn't feeling like it's tipping over. So we've got red and green um, are contrasting colors. Anything that's directly opposite of each other on the color wheel is going to be contrasting or complementary colors because they are literally the most unlike each other. They're furthest away from each other on the color wheel, um, direct opposites of each other. So um, that would be a contrasting color palette um, combination. One of my favorite color palette combinations when I'm trying to create a really subtle change or a really subtle movement with people's eyes when they're looking at a piece of paper or a composition is an analogous color palette. So an analogous color palette 
basically uses three or four or more, depends on, you know, the amount of colors you use, hues that sit right next to each other on the color wheel. So we could do red, orange, orange, yellow, orange, and yellow. This is going to be the most subtle transition with people's eyes. Might sound basic, but think about it. If people are subtly transitioning or moving to green, instead of just jumping from red, orange to green, it's gonna be a lot more easy for their eyes to move through these colors than jumping. So it's the same thing with, um, you know, using secondary and tertiary, tertiary colors are gonna help bridge that gap between your contrasting colors. So again, if we are using a red and green element up here, let's say, I'm making sure to mix in some red, orange, some orange and yellows around it so that it's subtly transferring between red and green instead of just boom, there's your red and green, if that's my purpose there. So analogous color palette is when you're using hues that sit directly next to each other on the color wheel. They're neighbors, they're family members, they know each other quite well because they are very similar in hue um, and they help people's eyes move really subtly, really peacefully through your piece, which is lovely. So secondary and tertiary colors are really key in bridging that gap because primary colors are always gonna be, you know, far further, not obviously as far as contrasting colors, but they're gonna be further away from each other um, than any tertiary color would be. So those tertiary colors come in handy when you're painting. And a lot of people, especially beginners, kind of just mix up their colors quickly without intention. And so think about how you could add a tertiary color on a on, let's just say a leaf where you have a lot of blue green and yellow green, maybe adding in some, or where you have a lot of just green, secondary green, maybe adding in some blue green and yellow green will help mix it up and bring in a nice peaceful movement element to the, to the branch. Okay, so that is extremely basic color theory. Um, there's a lot more color combinations that you can research on your own. Um, but I would recommend creating an actual color wheel. I have a tutorial where I teach you how to create this. So we'll link to it in this video. If you want to paint one of your own and set it up in your office or wherever you paint as a reference and a guide that you can always look back on. But next, that's kind of related to color theory. I want to talk about um, warm colors and cool colors and value scales. So if we look at a color wheel, we're going to separate our color wheel based on warm colors and cool colors. So anything that's from yellow and red violet up, so this half of the color wheel is going to be warm colors. So anything that has like a base or a base hue of red is going to be warm colors, think fire. And then we've got our cool colors underneath here. This half of the color wheel is gonna be cool colors. So anything that's the base of water, um, or you know that feeling of water is going to be a cool color. So blue greens, yellow greens, violet, red violet, I would consider a warm color just because it has that element of fire poking through or that reddish hue poking through. There are, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty, but there are blues that can be warm undertones. There are reds that can be cool undertones, but basically speaking, red and cool colors are going to be separate halves of the color wheel. What did I just say? Warm and cool colors are gonna be separate halves of the color wheel. And the reason why I, I point this out is because if you're painting with two cups of water, um, a lot of people get confused on where to rinse off their warm colors, where to rinse off their cool colors. That's the, the process that I use for cleaning my brushes off. So if you do the same, then you know anything over here is gonna be in your warm cup and then anything that is the cool, cool color is gonna be in your other cup. And the reason for that is you're always gonna have, with warm and cool colors, you're always gonna have one warm color, one cool color in a t contrasting uh, relationship. So red and green, for example. Red is a warm color, green is a cool color. And contrasting colors, whenever they're mixed together, always make a muddy, murky color. It can be gray, it can be brown, and that turns your water brown if you're only using one cup of water or you're mixing up uh, mixing off cool colors and warm colors in the same cup, then you're always gonna get muddy, murky water. And the style of painting that I do, I like to have rich, bold, bright colors, pure colors. I like to keep my colors as clean as possible when they're on my paper. And so if you like that as well, then I like to separate my cups of water so that I rinse off warm colors in one and cool colors in the other. So there is that. And then let's talk about value scales. So a color isn't just by itself um, one shade or one value. 
Uh, there are so many, with, this is why I love watercolor so much. We don't need to use white paint to, to lighten a color. We're gonna use water to make it more transparent and we don't need two, you know, multiple tubes of paint to make these different shades or values. So a value is the lightness and darkness of a color. The hue is the actual color itself or the pigment. Um, and so right here, this value scale is Scarlet Lake. Um, and I started with, you know, a rich amount of Scarlet Lake on my brush. I'll just show you. So to do a value scale, I'm gonna grab my size 16 brush and a lot of Scarlet Lake so that I can show this pigment in its darkest value. So all of your all of your watercolors that you use, you can get multiple values of that same color by just using water. So right about here is where I'm swirling my brush and trying to pick up a lot of this pigment so it's more opaque or a darker version, darker value of Scarlet Lake. And then I'm just gonna use a slanted hold about 15 degrees away from my paper with my size 16 brush and paint a little swatch area here. So there is probably my darkest value of Scarlet Lake um, using a lot more pigment than water. But then to lighten the color, I'm just gonna lighten what I have on my brush by flicking my brush and my water cup back and forth a couple of times, like so, and making sure to always swipe off the excess water on my jar and then we have a slightly lighter value. So one thing to notice or take note of when you are doing, trying to lighten a value, maybe in the middle of a painting, you're trying to get a lighter value of something, make sure you're not too aggressive with your flicking or not aggressive enough. So there's two different types of people. There's people that are really aggressive and they get rid of all that pigment in one foul swoop. And then there's people who are really scared of the water and do it very delicately. So take note of which person you are. But if you're just trying to gradually lighten the value of a color, um, I'm going back and forth a few times and always making sure I'm swiping the brush off on the edge of my cup or dabbing it on my paper towel. And we're just gradually getting lighter and lighter. And let's say I wanted to get to Scarlet Lake's lightest value. Um, then I would basically just get rid of all that pigment from my brush as much as I can. And obviously swipe off the excess water. And we have basically water with just a tint of red or Scarlet Lake. So value scales are a really great way to practice just gradually lightening a cup, lightening, gradually lightening a color. Um, it helps you get used to the movement, get used to that muscle memory of rinsing off your brush just gradually over um, gra a gradual scale. So I'd practice value scales. Again, I teach you how to do that in this little booklet. If you wanna download it for free, it's in there. And then also about hue scales. Um, if you wanna mix up two hues together, you know, creating secondary and tertiary colors, obviously, Red by itself, Scarlet Lake by itself is going to be a primary color, red. And then the more yellow pigment I roll around in, the more orange or red orange it's gonna get, and then eventually yellow. And if this stresses you out going directly on top of your pigment, you can mix up the colors in a secondary well over here in your palette. Um, but this again can be wiped up with some water and a paper towel. It can be cleaned up, so don't you worry. But this is just a great way to practice painting quickly um, because when you're in the middle of a big painting, like a floral piece, let's say, and you, you're painting a big red peony, but you want another flower next to it that's maybe a red orange, then you have red on your on your paintbrush. You can, all you need to do is just go to your yellow and make it move it a little bit more towards that red orange tertiary color so hue scale value scales all really really important stuff to practice especially if you're a beginner um, and getting used to color mixing getting used to gradually lightening a color with water because the more transparent the color is the lighter it is going to be the more pigment you have on your brush the more opaque or darker it's going to be and then again, studying color theory and color relationships because we're always wanting to create harmony with our colors 
and finding out where colors are maybe creating an element of unbalance or it feels like it's tipping on our paper composition wise. I also have a color chart video. So if you're one of the people who really struggles with knowing what colors to mix together to make certain pigments or hues, um, I have a color chart video, which is going to be really fun for you. It, it's, it's, I think one of the most beautiful things to paint, even though it's just squares. Um, but it's gonna teach you color mixing. It's gonna teach you how to uh, find certain colors out of maybe surprising combinations. So definitely check out that video. I hope you enjoyed this video. That was just one part of our complete beginner's guide to watercolor. So make sure you go check out that master video. It's got all the goods in it. And as always, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next tutorial.